not going to tell you. Um, we're all passionate developers. I wrote this book. This is a little plug, but it's not about this book. The talk is not about this book. But we are all passionate developers. Um, <laughs> and as passionate developers, we are out in the world. People like Ryan Davis are, are kind of like freedom fighters, fighting for software quality, are fighting for what is right in software development. Um, because we're passionate, though, and because we spend a lot of time doing that fighting, we can develop some kind of rigidity about what we believe. So that's what this talk is about today. Uh, a lot of us come from this kind of craftsmanship idea of the world, and this movement uh, resonates with us. These books came out over 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, I read Software Craftsmanship, the new imperative on the way to the first Ruby conference that uh, we co-organized in 2001. Kind of amazing. And we've been living with these ideas forever now in, in terms of my professional career. So you can kind of run into this thing where it sort of feels like a religion. But the issue, and what I want to talk about today, is that we have no idea what we're doing, <laughs> relatively speaking. We're all passionately chasing this thing that's based on emotion. I sat at lunch today and I talked to a group of passionate developers <coughs> about conference organization. And I've heard something that I hear very often in the Ruby world. I think the Ruby world is especially uh, passionate and also especially prone to the kind of mistakes that I'm going to describe today uh, through personal examples. And that is that we feel like we're out in the world spreading something that's good, almost like missionaries. So there are a lot of religious overtones to what we do and the way we behave as developers. It's really kind of strange. I'm sitting at lunch. And I kind of, I get swept up in it, and I believe in everything it's saying, and then I took a step back and I thought, why do we care that there are more Ruby developers? Why do we want to spread this thing that's bizarre? It's a programming language. It doesn't really matter, you know. If, if people program in Java forever or C Sharp, it really doesn't matter as long as there's new stuff in it. Anyway, welcome to the story of my ignorance. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background, how I got where I am, and some of the stupid ideas that I've had. And it starts here. So this is me. I'm the one on the left playing saxophone. This is my previous career. Uh, I was quite successful by the standards of a professional musician. And by that, I mean, here I am playing at the prestigious Memphis Zoo uh, in front of like an office or something. <laughs> I was pretty happy. I was playing maybe 10 times a week. I was playing weddings. I was playing Beale Street every night. But I started kind of thinking about my lot in life, and I thought, how am I going to ever make any more money than this? This really isn't scalable. Not that I said scalable when I was a saxophone player. <laughs> and, and not only that, but how am I going to afford to? <laughs> And unfortunately, I was going to eat at McDonald's. So if you saw me years later, you saw that there were ramifications to that as well. And do I really have to play Mustang Sally again? <laughs> Mustang Sally is in the key of C, as you're hearing it now. Strangely, in Memphis, all songs are in the key of C. <laughs> and they all have this tempo. And when you play saxophone pretty well and people dance, you have to play solos for 15 to 20 minutes while the song on the same chord as the So it's kind of sad. And what I really wanted to be doing, I realized at that time in my life, like right now, I'm sitting here, you can tell I'm kind of looking up into the air and thinking about something other than the riff from Mustang Sally. What I'm really thinking about is this. <laughs> Who knows what this is? Doom. This is what I wanted to be doing with my time. So I would go home be maybe 3 a.m. after I was playing all night in a bar, I might have had some wild turkey because I was ghetto back then, that's what I drank. And I would sit down at my computer and I would play Doom all night. Doom, Deathmatch, Deathmatch. I would call people in Canada, I don't know how I afforded this because you had to actually make phone calls with people. And it was like long distance international calls just so I could play like a two minute game of Doom. And then I would go and I would start thinking, wow, this is amazing, I love Doom. It's kind of like really, really fast chess. It's maybe one of the greatest human endeavors to have created this thing and given me the opportunity to do this. 
And I was probably better at doing than anything I had ever done up until that point in my life, including playing saxophone, which I had studied in school and practiced and practiced and practiced. So that made me think, well, I want to be able to do this myself. I want to be able to make do. How do they do this? How, how do they actually, like, do they type something into a text editor? I remember having this conversation with a friend saying, what do you do? You type something into a text editor. How does it become this thing that I can play? Why can't I read the text? How does that work? And I would stay up all night. I would, I would get on like a VAT system from the University of Memphis, and I would use Gopher, and I started doing like DCL or whatever that was called, because I thought maybe I could make do this. I don't know. But it ended up, ended up being like a local guru and fixing people's Doom installations and playing around with Doom add-ons and obviously one of the best Doom players in Memphis and, and in the world. And this, this led to the next natural progression in my career, which was to get a job in corporate America programming. So here I am. You can see me there. I'm leaning over. It's not really me. It's just a random picture. Um, I got a job in a corporation in a cubicle, and I thought, wow, this is awesome. I got it made. People kind of dress funny. So that's all right. I'm OK with that. I kind of dress funny, too. I got my own little box that I could sit in. I could listen to music. And I had a CRT. It's a cathode ray tube for you guys. <laughs> And I thought, well, I have got it. <laughs> Not only that, you know, I came from the music industry. And you don't get into music because you want to make a bunch of money, obviously. That's why I was out of it, right? But what you do get into music to do is you get into music to be awesome. You get into music to be like the best in the world. Nobody starts playing music thinking they're not going to be remarkable. And to me, that made this whole craftsmanship idea really resonate. Because, you know, I used to stay up all night, like, writing music and thinking and analyzing and stuff and practicing the saxophone. I remember actually sitting up one night, I had one of the early wind instruments, electronic wind, in wind instruments, what early have yeah, Early electronic wind instruments that I could play with headphones so I wouldn't disturb my roommates. And I literally spent all night, nonstop, improvising over the chord changes for Giant Steps by John Coltrane. So I took that same, by the way, Giant Steps by John Coltrane is an atrocity. Uh, if you think that's good music, you're wrong. Okay. Uh, I love John Coltrane, but not Giant Steps. It's just a mathematical experiment. Get over it. Uh, but I took that same kind of thinking of like really caring about the craft. And this clock is not moving, so I have perpetually 60 minutes. It's awesome. By the way, I shouldn't have an hour. The other people who spoke today should have an hour. Whatever. That's the thing about me. So everything was okay until one day I encountered this term, Six Sigma. And Six Sigma, they use words like master black belt and green belt to describe people. And I remember the first job I got where they did this, I was like, you didn't say any of this shit in the interview, and now I show up at work and you're calling people green belt. This is not okay. <laughs> but I moved, it was like, wow, I just moved to a new city to listen to people call each other green belts and talk about all kinds of strange stuff like this. And I mean, people at this company were just like, lemmings following this thing around. It was GE, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, it was ridiculous, and it was, it was scary, you know, these people were getting paid a lot of money and they're just saying, oh, crap, and, you know, it's like, whoa, here I am, and I thought I was really, really kind of in a good situation where I could focus on the beauty and the craft of software development, and now everybody's saying all these crazy words, <laughs> and they actually pronounce them like demadvi and demaic, and they don't laugh when the other one says it. <laughs> So I thought, what have I got myself into? And they're, it's nonsense. It's like Babel, you know. What a bunch of crap. Anyway, but I started thinking about it, and I realized that there were some things that we would talk about that just sounded the same to these people, you know. For example, abstract factory singleton facade, flyweight builder bridge, etc. <laughs> we have our own ridiculous terminology. So at that point, it's like, okay, whatever. I can live with this. I've got my cubicle. I'll put on some headphones, I'll listen to some really offensive music, and nobody will know what will be happy. I'll just write some software. 
And then I had a conversation that ruined it all. It went something like this, I'm talking to a manager, crafting high quality software, so happy. And this person comes along, this is a real story, and says, give me a process for developing high quality software. Document it and give it to me. So we can hire more offshore developers. <laughs> I just can't ignore this thing, you know. And the conversation that I had after that, I, I probably ruined the rest of my career at that moment at the company. Because I said something like, you give me a process for writing a beautiful song. Or creating a beautiful piece of art. Just write down the list, write it down on a list, and I'll hire a bunch of offshore songwriters and have a bunch of awesome hit songs. <laughs> So here's the problem, quality. What does that mean? That's the basis of many of the decisions that we make in our field. You know, like, I mean, Ryan was getting pretty kind of quantitative about it, kind of concrete. But a lot of us just say, you can't do that. You can't hire cheap people. You can't think about cost per hour. You can't offshore stuff and put it in cheap locations and get people who are passionate because they're going to develop stuff that's not high quality. And then we have this whole kind of thing, like, look at all the testing tools and libraries that we use in the really <coughs> Rails world. Is that quality? What is quality? There's a bunch of different definitions for quality. Um, I like this one, the adjective of or having superior quality. <laughs> <laughs> so I posted a message on Twitter, because this is how I do talk preparation these days. Um, <laughs> I have a bunch of followers on Twitter who are programmers, so I say things like this. Developers, can you define software quality in a single tweet? And I got them a whole bunch of single tweets. Some of them single word discipline. Quality software does what it should and is easy to change. Quality is cracked in Polish. What do you do with people from Poland? <laughs> anyway, here's my favorite one. No. <laughs> Like making software easy to change, clean, beautiful, fast, works, cheap, extensible, shiny, etc. That's the kind of stuff I heard. So I went to the source of all things about quality. All right. I wonder if you know what this is. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. That's right. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. If you have not read this book, you must not have ever seen me speak. I recommend it constantly to the point where you will read it so you, have, you can stop hearing me say this. Please read it. It's really good. Anyway, here's a quote from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. With quality as a central, undefined term, reality is, in its essential nature, not static, but dynamic. So if you have this problem of not having quality defined, you can turn it into this and think, well, hey, man, it's kind of cool. Let's just not define it. I can deal with that. It's cool. I'm a Ruby programmer. Ruby you know? <laughs> programmers like things to be dynamic. They like things to be kind of, you know, we're a bunch of hippies, right? <laughs> so I'm comfortable with this kind of fluid definition of something that's central and important. So I can kind of go with the flow. Um, but there was trouble lurking below still. No matter where I went, I would try to kind of rationalize my way around these problems and fix them, but I couldn't. Because I'm I'm getting submerged, submerged, I'm getting immersed in Six Sigma and submerged in Six Sigma. And if you look at Six Sigma, anything about it, you're going to see the word quality. It's going to be all about measuring quality. It's like, oh crap, I cannot ignore the word quality now. I can't just kind of go along and say, okay, whatever, I'll define quality. I tried to, and they would say, well, measure it. You know, what is the output signal? And what are your metrics? Like, I don't know, I'm a software developer, it's good stuff. That's all I know. <laughs> it's good, I'm smarter than you, etc. <laughs> so here's the issue. Quality has a variety of definitions. And there's kind of a continuum of how you measure it and how you talk about it. So on one side, you have the one that I was using, which is you know, form. This is beautiful software, shiny, stuff like that. 
And then on the other side, you have function. And that's where the kind of commodity things are. In the middle, you have craft, somewhere there in the middle. So let's look at some things of varying levels of quality. This is a Mark Rothko painting. That's jam on toast. This is a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Which one has higher quality? Rhetorical question, don't answer. Music. <laughs> Grab the bucket and mop. Scrub the bottom and pop. There is nothing so clean. That's my burger machine. With a broom and a brush. Stuff that I cared about. You know, 
how is it organized, what are things called, that sort of thing. Now, I used to talk about maintainability, but I had no measurement for it. So you could say that maintainability itself, if important, which we'll talk about might, might not even be important, is external quality as well. So internal quality doesn't matter is the conversation I had with him, which just drove me crazy. <laughs> but it really comes down to this. Who gives a crap about form on the form versus function scale? So how many of you write code for businesses, government, or educational institutions? By show of hands. Those of you who don't, what do you do? <laughs> if you're not programmers, that's fine. But pretty much all of you, and I'll just discredit the rest of you. <laughs> so here's what your customers think about form versus function. Something like this. Like maybe, maybe they care a little bit about form. It's probably more like this. <laughs> they really just don't give a crap. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if it's beautiful, as long as it does what they want. And it may be that you're saying, well, it needs to be maintainable. They don't care about that either, in some cases. It's all right to throw it away. If I have money, I can say, do this one time and have it work the one time, and I'll just pay you to do it again later or pay someone else. I don't care. So here's something that I sort of learned from the Six Sigma world. If you can't observe something, it doesn't actually exist. Uh, sorry for religious people. People will take exception to this, but I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about our jobs. So here we have people with kind of two different takes on this. On one side, we have Justice Potter Stewart, um, who was famous for his judgment on pornography, where he said basically the definition of pornography is I know it when I see it. That was in a Supreme Court case, amazingly. And on the right, we have Ibn al-Haytham, who is credited with starting what has become the scientific method. So it kind of comes down to that. I'll know, I know it when I see it is what we try to do in the software community, in the software craftsmanship. But there can be science to some of this stuff. There can be engineering to some of this stuff. So if you can't measure it, in a way, it isn't real. It isn't something you can talk to someone about, unless they have the same kind of subjective opinions that you do. So we already know this. Um, this is Donald Knuth. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. We all kind of believe that, right? Except those who don't really get it. The rest of us believe this. We also, in this room, are probably all pretty much in the kind of task-driven development world. In a way, that's a, that's a, a case of measuring something. So we, we get the idea of measuring stuff, but then we keep talking about code quality without a great way to measure it. So I don't think we actually know what high-quality code is. What we as developers like to do is solve the most convenient automatable problem that we can find. And if it's not automatable and therefore measurable, we don't like to like think about measuring it. At least that's how I am, and that's how many of my peers have been over the years, if not all of them. So the problem then is what do we measure? So if we want to talk about quality and make it a measurable thing, how do we do that? How do we break down something that seems so big and potentially even artistic and crafty or whatever you want to call it, and, and measure it? And this is where Six Sigma actually has some good ideas. So I'm not going to spend the rest of the time talking about Six Sigma, but I'm going to just briefly go into one part of that. Um, this is the, the Six Sigma kind of workflow or life cycle. And you'll see here on, on the Babel slide, I structured like DemandV and Demand. Those are just acronyms, that really bad acronyms for two different processes in the Six Sigma world. So there's the idea of designing something new and then improving something that exists. And that's what you see here. So conceptually, we can probably all kind of get behind the ideas that Six Sigma promotes, which is you think about things and measure and analyze, maybe not really slowly, you don't have to do it slowly, but you think about things, you make them measurable, you design, you actually validate, TDD is kind of like that, that's how you create something new, and then when you're wanting to improve something, for example, performance on a piece of software, you define what the problem is, you measure it, you analyze what the issues are, um, you make improvements, you validate your improvements are there, and then you put a control plan in place um, where I think uh, 
uh, Ryan actually just said that for the Airroll stuff, they put in kind of a control plan for performance of Airroll uh, using Manytest. So the framework that Six Sigma provides, um, designed for Six Sigma or DMADME as they unfortunately call it, it looks something like this. There's a whole bunch of different like they call, call it tools, and sometimes it's tools, sometimes it's just ideas, patterns, process patterns, et cetera, for, for doing these things. And so if you look here, these are the different phases of the process, and then there's all these different things you can do. Um, we're gonna look at one of them that I think is actually worth at least exploring to, to st stimulate some thought, not stimulate, stimulate some thought on the process of taking something that seems too abstract to measure and making it measurable. And that's this thing, quality function deployment. So quality function deployment is something you typically do with a spreadsheet, unfortunately, because that scares a lot of people off. Uh, but basically what it does is it takes fuzzy ideas and it tries to break them down in ways that make, make them um, measurable in a way that you can validate. And um, so you basically take uh, high-level fuzzy desires from a customer, and a customer could be you, could be someone you're working for, and you break them down. And it works recursively. So you, you take these ideas, you break them down into measurable chunks that you can then analyze and validate and improve, and then you take those things and you make those be like the objectives and you keep going. Uh, and at the end of it, you end up with a transfer function for quality which is sort of ridiculous, but it's at least provable to map to the things that someone asked for. And you can actually say, like, if I tweak this parameter, it has a bigger effect than if I tweak this parameter. Rather than just trying to guess and follow your own judgment and you know, subjective ideas. So here is a, a zoomed in kind of idea, or a zoomed in look. The way this works is on the left side, you'll just list the high level things that that the customer is looking for. So that's, that's there on the left, what the customer wants. So here we're talking about cookies. <laughs> the, cookie, the customer wants good texture and generous portions and taste good, all these sorts of things that are totally subjective and are the kinds of things you talk about when you talk to a customer, right? Then, up here, you brainstorm technical requirements that will actually drive those things. So, their appetizing appearance, color, Tensile, we're all concerned with tensile yield strength. <laughs> Weight, I ripped this off from somewhere, obviously. Uh, thickness, all these different things that are just measurable items. And these are the things we might should focus on to actually drive the things the customer asked for. And then, you see we map strength, like correlation between those things on this grid and whether it's positive or negative, strong or weak, then you end up with target values. And you get those by actually testing things, putting together examples of all these different variables and seeing what they lead to, maybe just in terms of just asking the customer, now that I've done this, what is the correlation between these settings and your satisfaction? And there's the relationship strength. So in a way, once you've validated this spreadsheet, you kind of have a high-level view of taking something that is not easy to measure and breaking it into measurable pieces. You can then validate how those pieces affect the measurable part. And we've already done something good. We've taken something fuzzy and made it more concrete and measurable. Then, oh yeah, it creates an auto-generated priority score. You can probably figure out yourself that that would be possible once you get all these pieces in place because you've got weightings and everything. Then you take that whole top section, which is the weight and the color and all these other things, and you recursively stick it in another one of these, put them on the left, and then on the, on the top, you start listing the broken down version of how you can affect those things with, again, smaller, even more measurable pieces. And that's how ultimately you end up with, you actually do experiments, you know, we're probably not going to do it for every piece of software, right? We're just thinking here. But that's how you end up with transfer functions, formulas for quality as the customer defined it. And we're talking about cookies here. So if you can actually measure quality of a cookie, you can probably measure quality of a piece of software that you're writing. Probably a little easier than measuring the quality of a cookie. 
But you have to actually worry about the definition of quality, as opposed to just kind of using it as a word that allows you to stop having rational conversations. <laughs> so then you validate results. So that's the whole idea. Just like TDP, you just validate. So we have assumptions, we have targets. Um, Dave Thomas did a talk at Magic Ruby, uh, which was roughly the 10 year anniversary of the authoring of the Agile Manifesto. He's one of the co-authors of that. And he boiled agility down to this. Where do we want to be? Where are we now? How do we improve our, our position? And then you just keep doing it. It's kind of funny. That's what this is. This is just more formalized. So when I first saw Six Sigma and Agile Methodologies, it was XP back then, I thought, wow, this is just this kind of is the same thing, but one sounds more stupid than the other. <laughs> and it might have been XP, Extreme Programming. It's a pretty stupid idea uh, for a name. Anyway, so this idea of actually applying kind of scientific engineering thinking to programming is obviously not mine at all. Um, it's been screwed up over the years, and recently some really smart people have been thinking about how to do it right. This is Mike Feathers at RailsConf last year, keynoting, he was talking about what is bad code. He showed this Java code, and there was a method that was obviously something we all wanted to refactor when we saw it. He said, is this bad code? And everyone said, yes, it's bad code. And then he said, what if I told you this code works and has never been changed since the first time it was created? And that makes you think, okay, what's bad about it? Is it the first thing is, all right, if it works, that's fine. There weren't any performance problems we could see. So the only thing you can go back to is, well, I can't read this very well and I can't maintain it. But the method name was okay. So I don't have to maintain it because it doesn't ever change. Hmm, maybe this isn't bad code. So that's sort of an interesting conversation we had. And he had started doing a bunch of experiments where he was analyzing source code repositories. So we did a code retreat in Boulder. Uh, I guess it was in October. No, it was in WOW. It was in February of this year. Um, Mike Tame, uh, Corey Haynes, and I facilitated the code retreat, and the three of us got together and we made this tool called Turbulence. So you can gem install Turbulence, and it really just takes Mike's ideas and codifies them into a gem that allows you to do some analysis. So what I've done here is I, I installed Turbulence, and I ran it on uh, one of our Rails applications at Living Social, and I came up with this. And this is a pretty small app, as you can see. Um, Basically, you can see helpers models, stuff in lib, stuff in controllers, generators. And we're looking at the uh, complexity versus code churn uh, visualized here. So you can mouse over if you get this thing. Um, you have to run, the command line is bule, B-U-L-E. You run it from, um, obviously that's the middle words of turbulence, right? Everybody loves that name. And you mouse over, say, that thing in lib there, and you will find out what its flog score is, we're using flog, thank you Ryan, um, and what its churn score is, and we've done that as sort of a, a low budget kind of easy churn score. And we can see that the thing in the upper right is probably a good target for refactory. If you look through this app and you ask what is bad code in this app, it's probably that thing up there. There might be something of really high complexity, in fact a couple of our other apps have stuff that's of really high complexity that's never changed. So I would say, don't waste your time screwing around with that. I have an interesting, interesting way to break down what seems like kind of subjective measurements, but apply some pragmatic thinking. And Glenn Vanderberg has been talking a lot lately as well about uh, engineering and software development. If you haven't seen one of his real software engineering talks, you should seek one out. They're available on video. Video from, I guess, RailsConf this year, Ruby Hoedown last year of other venues he's done different versions of it. But what Glenn has been saying is that we, we have given engineering a bad name because we haven't actually been doing engineering in software development. I think that's quite obviously true. Engineering is something that is proven to work. And we just call things software engineering and never bothered with the proof that it works part. So anyway, that's the end of my Six Sigma spiel.
why? Because you're trying to sneak. <laughs> <laughs> Think of me. See my smile. Uh, rich dad, poor dad, the Harlequin romance of finance. <laughs> <laughs> The author says, can you make a burger better than McDonald's? And I could ask you, and you'd all say yes, except for those of you who are vegan. <laughs> uh, actually, you would make a burger just with some beef. Right? Um, then, can you sell a burger better than McDonald's? That's the next question. If you think about that, the answer is almost definitely no, right? Can you make software better than McDonald's makes burgers? Well, on average, no, you cannot. This is the Standish Chaos Report from 94 to 2009. And it's showing here, uh, successful projects are the green ones, challenged are the white ones, and then red or failed. But challenged means like way over budget and or way over time. So in my book, that's also a failure, which means Based on this, which is just a survey, and there's all sorts of people you know, disputing whether this is valid, but whatever, we know it is. We've been there, right? We're all, we're all programmers, we've seen it happen. We basically just suck, all of us. All of us. <laughs> on average, you all suck, I suck, we fail to deliver. Um, it's, it's just, I don't know why, it's, it's years. Years into this thing, and we're still not doing it right. We're still not in control of our processes. So what does McDonald's have that we don't have? So I would say that the first thing is McDonald's has really well-documented, rigid systems in place. Um, this is someone finishing an ultramarathon. So an ultramarathon is a, a race that is longer than a marathon. For people like me, that means 50K. Um, for real ultra marathon, and I, not that I ever ran one, but I hope to. But 50k will be just like right over a marathon length. That's enough to call it an ultra marathon, and I'm done. Um, <laughs> for some people, it's 200 something miles, and they just, or or it's 100 miles through mountains and craziness. Humans can't really just start running and and do this. You don't, you know, you certainly don't start where I was three years ago and say, yeah, I'm going to run 100 miles and just do it. And you also don't, don't say that and think, well, I'll just practice and then I'll do it. Because you can't just figure that out. You have to put a system in place to make that happen. So if you look at the, the world of endurance sports, you can get some pretty interesting ideas. Uh, this is Kiwi McMinn's training plan for her Ironman, the first one that she attempted and actually failed. Um, Amy McMinn is a, is a Ruby developer, some of you may know her. She is now finished two, I think? Yeah, two? She's finished two, and she's competed in three Ironman triathlons, which is where you basically cover like 3,000 miles on foot, and, and, then you, and then you fly by your own power. <laughs> this is her plan for a year. And we can't really read it, it doesn't really matter what it says, but you can see February, March, April, blah, blah, blah. I, I went through this sort of a thing when I was going from being extremely obese to being able to run 5K, but my spreadsheet was much smaller, obviously. But I went through the same thing, and every, every like, sports-related thing I've been able to make my sad body do, it's been through following a system like this. And I look at this, and I think there is a strong chance that even though an Iron Man seems impossible, if I had the willpower and the desire to do one, and I got the same system, but tweaked for me, I could almost definitely do it. That's pretty amazing. Going from, I can't imagine how to do it, to actually finishing something like this crazy Iron Man race. I think most normal people could do it if they followed a system, but that's really the secret. If things that seem impossible to do well are possible if you have a system that you can stick to it. And uh, so here's an example system from our field. This is actually no less complex than Design for Six Sigma or Kiwi's Iron Man training. This is extreme programming. And it's a flowchart from extremeprogramming.org. But we kind of get these ideas already, naturally, as software developers. Now, so the next step, when, when you find a system that works and you can then implement it, 
the next step might be then to start thinking about how you make that system run itself. A big problem we have in software development is that we focus on people, uh, at least those of us who are craftspeople do. We think that it really is up to the individual programmers being excellent to make software come out and succeed. But what I've learned is that it doesn't really matter how excellent the programmers are, the software projects still tend to fail. So if you can make a system, prove that it works, you might actually improve your results, then work on making that system run itself. Um, this is Ray Kroc eating a burger. Ray Kroc is the guy who found the McDonald brothers by going to one of the restaurants and said, you guys have made a system for making this work. I'm going to take it and start cloning it and copying it and turn it into a franchise. And the reason that I'm showing Ray Kroc here is the other book that I always tell people to read, The um, Myth Revisited, the second worst name of a book ever. The first one is My Job Went to India. Uh, so, in the e-myth, this is about why small businesses fail. It's not about, like, e-commerce or whatever. That's what I always thought. Bad name, because it, it, I think that it's an e-commerce myth book. It's about feeling stuck inside of a business. It's about working in the business that you're trying to start instead of working on the business. As software developers, we tend to do this. You work in your job instead of working on your job. Pretty much all of us. But if we could all take a step back and look at, like, what are the things that make me successful, maybe I can then start to break it apart and give it to other people. I think John Barnett talked about this a little bit yesterday, but um, make an org chart for what you do. I started doing this last year. Partially because I was thinking maybe I could actually outsource some of the things I do to someone cheaper than me and take some time off. It won't work out, but maybe someday. Make an org chart, and the, the example that Michael Gerber uses in the book is with a single business owner. Making an org chart for everything she did, and then documenting, like coming up with job responsibilities and titles for everyone in that org chart. Making a system out of it, Getting to the point where you can then hand off pieces of it to someone else. Because there is stuff you do that you don't have to be the one to do. No matter who you are, how smart you think you are, what you work on. So you can organize this into, a, into an org chart. And then once you have that org chart, you have this hierarchy. If you think about it, different pieces of, the, of what you do as a software developer map into different pieces of what makes a software good. So you can potentially even take the things from the, the QFD, quality function deployment, formula kind of ideas and apply them to the org chart and then say not only do I have the org chart kind of laid out, but I can then outsource it perhaps or automate it. And I have measurable goals for each piece of it. And at that point you can start to actually give things to people who aren't as good as you may be. Whatever that means. Um, but give them pieces of your job and be able to check whether they're doing it well. That's the reason we can't let go of responsibility, because we can't trust other people or systems, whatever it happens to be, because we haven't actually thought about what makes each one of these pieces good versus not good. So you measure the, the results, and you can do this just by yourself, and basically come up with like a continuous build system for yourself, measuring the different important parts of what make you what you are. And what you end up with there is consistency. So for example, if you're ever in a place like Japan or Korea and you're feeling um, some culture shock, or you're just feeling like you know, you've walked from restaurant to restaurant, you can't find an English language menu, and you can't speak Korean or Japanese, and you ended up getting a plate full of some sort of meat because you just pointed at something and you were really hungry. Yes. Uh, Yes. That's right. That was a great time, wasn't it? That was Ruby Kaigi two or three years ago. Uh, find the Starbucks. Because at Starbucks, they have a system like this. Now, I know people here don't like Starbucks, but whatever. Make it McDonald's. Because those of you who don't like Starbucks certainly like McDonald's. <laughs> Starbucks has this kind of system in place. They have this kind of consistency. You can walk into a Starbucks in Japan and the most ridiculous drink that you would do in the U.S., you know, with all your stupid little stuff that you need on it, and they will know what you're talking about, and they'll give it to you, and it will taste exactly as bad as it does in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> That's comfortable. 
So the last piece of this presentation is on offshoring. Offshore projects fail. Anecdotally worse than average. I've been part of them failing, and yeah, it does seem like it's worse than average, even for me. And the reason for that is that offshore developers suck, <laughs> right? Unlike me. <laughs> but really, one thing I learned when I lived in India, running an offshore development outsourcing group, was that when you're in India, or you're in the Philippines, or wherever, the people in the United States are the offshore people, and they suck in the exact same way <laughs> that offshore developers in India suck when you're here. So it's actually not the developers, usually. It's the distance, it's the communication, etc. They deliver low-quality code, but of course, we don't know what that means. So th but that's an argument against it. So I was talking to uh, Dave Hooper about this at the Software Craftsmanship North America conference. We were riding a bus around getting sick in Chicago, and uh, he said, this is what we need to be asking. Not, not show me how to make it work, show me how to make it better. Name one time that has actually worked. And I said, well, okay, I'll tell you several times it actually worked. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I went to India. I wrote this book partially about my experiences there. Don't buy it, it's out of print, but you could buy it from someone else on eBay or something. Okay. Um, I went to India to set up a software development out outsourcing group. And I did it because I was at the same company where I'd been asked to come up with a, a list of steps for making great software. I decided that the list of steps should be I hire all the developers and then I create a culture that they can work within that I trust will make good code. And uh, the, the short version is it actually worked. So we had 350 people in Bangalore developing code, owning things, being real members of this extended team that was otherwise based in Louisville, Kentucky. The only problem is the people in India could not understand the people in Kentucky because people in Kentucky talk funny. <laughs> um, so this could be a whole subject of some other talk that you wouldn't want to hear, but it, it can work. Um, years later, I read this book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Um, a lot of people read this book and thought, well, what a bunch of bullshit, that guy's too proud of himself, and this is just malarkey crap. But I had been in India and I had seen offshoring work, and the, the, the idea behind Tim Ferriss' book is to outsource things that you do, outsource your life. And he likes extreme names, like you're only going to work for four hours a week or whatever. Um, he probably works 80 hours a week in reality. But I had seen the ideas from his book work in software development, so I got really excited about it. And um, I actually tried an experiment in 2009 using, I think he recommended this book, the <coughs> service in the book, AskSunday.com. I started outsourcing stuff to low-cost virtual assistants. Um, in this case, with Ask Sunday, it was stuff like doctor's appointments, travel, research, purchases of things. For example, there was a woman in New Orleans that um, has these really awesome boots that my wife needs, so I took a picture of them. I sent it to Ask Sunday and had them look all over the internet and find the boots. So I thought, you know, where do you get these things? Um, and it was really good. Like, I went to the doctor when I normally wouldn't have. Um, I went to the dentist and I got new glasses. That was the last time I did. But it was a very successful uh, experiment. So then I went to the next level. Eric Simmers told me about this company, BMG BPO. They're based in Bangalore. They do more like business process outsourcing. So what I had them do was research stuff for technical talks, get pictures. Um, I had a ton of, of books and CDs that I wanted to sell. So my first project was I just took pictures of my bookcases and CD cases and sent it to them and said, list all these on eBay for whatever price is appropriate for them and sell everything. And they did. And I got money that went in my PayPal account and I paid them through PayPal. So I kept them going for a while just by having them sell my stuff, which I wanted to do anyway. And it was like books that I will never pick up again. Obviously, I won't anymore. So there, there I am outsourcing, offshoring. You know, I don't really even care where they are. I'm using the internet. I can call someone who wants to do that. And I was talking to a friend of mine. I, I helped start this company many years ago. Um, and now, and, and decided not to be a part of it, unfortunately. And now they're very successful. It's a software development firm based in Mangalore. Touch. 
And I was talking to this friend, and I was, I was about to start on the second edition of Rails Recipes, and I said, I should just get some programmer to like port all of these recipes from the original book to Rails 3 and do a bunch of the work that I'm just dreading. How much would it cost for me to get an assistant with your company? And he said, $10 an hour. So I thought, wow, I charge like $900 an hour. I could get someone for 10. I don't really charge 900, only 800, but I could get someone for 10. <laughs> And I thought, wow, um, ten dollars an hour. What could they do that I could do at my high rate, whatever that happens to be? What could they do for ten dollars an hour that I was doing for, you know, a couple hundred maybe sometimes? How do we define value in this case? Like, if I do the thing that they could do, am I ripping you off, really? That's not a good. That's not a good value to use me for something when I could use them for something. And that made me think a lot. Holding that thought for a minute, in uh, July of 2009, I got this email from uh, Anthony Burns. And it says, last night there was a bunch of other stuff, you know, like love letter kind of stuff and, and devotional ideas. But last, here's the part that's important. Last night I realized this to some extent whilst I was sitting in the wonderful 90 degree heat that we call normal for 11 p.m. here, talking to the lizard that lives underneath the trailer I stay in. And this is not someone in Arkansas. This is someone in, that was emailing me from Iraq. So, Anthony Burns, 32nd Infantry Brigade. He was learning Rails, and he started emailing me. And I thought, wow, I was kind of touched. You know, this is someone who is reading my stuff, and I'm helping him, and he's asking me questions. And I thought, okay, let's work together. I started sort of mentoring him. Um, here's the picture of him with his gun, <laughs> reading passionate programmer. <laughs> So I thought, hey, let's, let's do like an apprenticeship, but it'll be an offshore apprenticeship. So he'll be over there. It's not quite as far as India, but it's close. And I'll be over here. I was in Colorado. Um, and I had him start working on apps that I wanted that I didn't have time to do. I said, okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. You write these apps. I'm going to be your customer. I'm going to use the apps, but I'm also going to review all the code. And I would, I would make one little suggestion and the rest of the app would change based on that suggestion. It was amazing. And I could only talk to him like every other night sometimes on IM. Then he'd say like I won't be around for a few days because I'm going on a mission. I would worry. You know? I didn't know what he did. It turned out what he did was pretty scary actually. Um, so under those circumstances, it, it actually still worked, though. So he came back to the U.S. and he was going to go back and do whatever you do after you've gone to a deployment like that. And rather than that, we hired him at InfoAther as, as an intern. And then he impressed us so much, we hired us at, or we hired him full-time at InfoAther. Um, and now he works full-time for me at Living Social, since InfoAther has been acquired by Living Social. So what's the difference between offshore apprenticeship like this and offshore outsourcing? I think the differences are two. One is just your perception of whether or not it's going to possibly work. When we do offshore outsourcing, we just assume it's going to suck and those people are no good. The other is our investment, our personal investment in it. And in this case, I was moved by this young guy who was trying to learn. I mean, I would have been even if I met him in a suburb in Colorado, but he was, he was so passionate and he was protecting our country. But he was, he was out there fighting for us. So it changed my opinion of how I should treat him and what kind of attention I should give to him. This is the Mechanical Turk. And uh, Anthony Burns is nothing like the Mechanical Turk, but I think about this in terms of automation. We all believe that you should automate what you can. For programmers, it's built into us, it's ingrained. However, we don't believe in outsourcing or offshoring or hiring cheap labor. And it's kind of funny because programmers, even the cheapest programmer, is usually smarter than my Ruby script. So maybe you can kind of think of outsourcing and delegation, whatever it happens to be, um, in terms of automation that's hard to actually do with a computer. This is Ken Auer, 
one of the early XP guys, and last year at Software Craftsmanship North America, where I happened to be, his, his talk was all about this. Have cheap people do easy things under the close supervision of people who know the difference between easy and hard things. This is pretty interesting. Coming from someone who's so much a software craftsmanship or craftsman. So, in summary, I think we should think about defining what quality means before we start really talking about it and using it as a, a basis of our arguments. Um, and to do that, you need to make fuzzy things as concrete as you can. You need to actually then measure them. Put systems in place so that you're not dependent on yourself or your colleagues being always on, on your or their A games. Always the best. Systems can help you and others. And then you, you start thinking about making that into a decomposed system that can then be farmed out to other people or to, to scripts or whatever it happens to be automated. And you get consistency through repeatability. Consistency, you always hear this phrase, you can't cross a river using averages. Because it might be you might be at your ankles at one level and then way above your head somewhere else. This is the same thing with quality of work. If sometimes your quality is badass and sometimes it's horrible, your customers will be left with horrible. That's the taste. That's the aftertaste. When you take these ideas and automate and replicate them. And don't be so damn proud of yourself. Because <laughs> you cost a lot of money. You probably could cost more than you do, though. That's another talk for later. And remember that automation doesn't have to be so strictly defined. So there's this story from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, the South Indian Monkey Trap. Now, I think it's actually bullshit, but I'll tell it to you anyway. It <laughs> illustrates an important point. Value rigidity. Um, the people of South India devised a way of trapping annoying macaque monkeys. They look like this. They're terrifying. They steal your potato chips. Take it from me. Um, <laughs> the idea is you dig a long hole, and then you hollow out the bottom of it with a stick. So it's in the ground. And then you pour like rice down it. You, you put a fairly decent amount, and you fill up that bottom section with it. And you wait until the monkeys come along. They stick their arms down in the hole, and they grab, and they grab, and they finally get a handful. And then you come along with a club. And, and they're so fixated on keeping the rice that they won't pull their hands out of the hole. So then you just beat them to death slowly. <laughs> <laughs> That's value rigidity. You care too much about that thing, that rice. So I bring this up because as freedom fighters, as the people who are out here crusading for what's right in the world, for all of us who have been that guy or that woman who has been in a company trying to educate all the idiots on how to do software development right, it may be that we develop our own value rigidity like this. We might be grasping that rice, and we might be actually holding on to bullshit that's not real. Maybe all these test frameworks and code quality and object orientation and Node.js Cucumber and all this shit is just yak shape. <laughs> 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 <laughs>